say we look forward to you. See you come again. Okay. Something about this time of year. I don't know why it means so much more and I know it should mean the same amount every day. I'm so grateful every day. I'm so grateful you revealed the glory of God and everything you said it did. And I'm so grateful that you died for my sins and for everyone's sins. I'm so grateful you rose again from the grave, proving that your payment for sin was all that was needed. I'm so grateful that one day you will come and we will be with you forever, and I will finally lose this sin nature. And I will be able to say like you said, I always do the will of my Father. You are great and wonderful and majestic God. And we are honored to be here.
So many people want to find Eden again, but Father, I don't want to find Eden. Because Eden is where humankind said, my will be done. Lord, let us awake every morning in Gethsemane. Let us pray, I surrender all, not my will, but thine be done. As we poured out our hearts before you this morning, it's been such a sweet worship service the songs that your children have sung to you. I know they've blessed your heart. We poured ourselves out before you and emptied ourselves before your throne. And now we seek for your word to fill us. Teach us from the word you so carefully prepared in our pastor this morning. And may we go out and live in power this week a little more like you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In your awesome powerful, eternal name we pray. Amen. It was about midnight when 
Jesus and the disciples, minus Judas, left the upper room, went through the eastern gate of the walls of Jerusalem, down the Kidron Valley, up the other side, the eastern slope of the Kidron, with the walls of Jerusalem behind them, and ascended part of the way up until they came to a garden, a garden of olive trees, a place that was very familiar to them, a place that they would often frequent, a place so familiar that Judas Iscariot, the one who would betray him, well, he knew where to find Jesus that night. They came to this very familiar place, and the darkness of the night spoke more than just uh, on a normal night. For evil was at work on this night. The leaves were still rustling. The birds were still singing. The cool breeze uh, that swept down the Kidron uh, was still a, a bit chilling on their bodies this late at night. The disciples were exhausted. It had been a very busily packed week. And this day was no different. The preparations for the Last Supper, uh, the uh, uh, arrival there, all of the teaching uh, that took place that was just more than they could soak in, more than they could comprehend. Uh, the, the, the moment there uh, uh, at the beginning when Jesus takes off his outer garments and wraps himself in a servant's towel and then goes and fills a basin with water, and disciple to disciple, he washes all of their feet. The, the job of a servant, not a king. That moment during the Paschal meal, they were celebrating Passover, when Jesus took that bread and inaugurated what we know as the Lord's Supper, when he spoke words to them about his own body and about his own blood, words that they did not comprehend, they did not accept. That night when he dipped that morsel and handed it uh, as the host would to the guest of honor, and he hands that ceremonial piece to Judas, who that night was the guest of honor at their paschal meal. And he says, what you do, do quickly. And the disciples don't even know what he's talking about. Now, it's late at night. Often in that culture, the sun goes down, you do too. You just make preparations and you go to bed. But it's been hours and hours filled with teaching and, and, and ceremony and, and prophecy. And they're tired, they're exhausted. So they arrive at Gethsemane and... Uh, as they stopped there, Jesus asked for three of the disciples to just go a little further with him. So he picks out Peter and James and his brother John. And he says, will you come with me? And so they move a little further into the garden from the rest who are uh, waiting there. And as they arrive a little further into the garden, uh, he's going to ask them, to just wait here for a moment while he goes a stone's throw away and begins to pray. And he asked them to watch, to watch for me. Oh, there's, a, there's an intimacy there that I think uh, in, in, in our study of Scripture we may overlook how that the King of kings and the Lord of lords on this night is asking his friends to pray for him. Now, sometimes we get that request and and it's almost like a hello, how are you doing kind of thing. Yes, of course I'll pray for you, but we don't. But on this night, Jesus, with all the sincerity, uh, asked these disciples to pray for him. <laughs> to pray for him. Something is going on in the mind of the Savior on this evening. Something different than uh, he, he had encountered before. In Matthew 26, verse 36. It says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Jesus is unusually sorrowful. Uh, the, the writer, Matthew, wants to point that out. He repeats it twice, both in the quote of Jesus and in his commentary preceding it. He wants uh, us, the reader, to understand that this is not a, a, a normal night of concern for Jesus, that there is something different about him. There is a sorrow that is so deep that it's even threatening to take his life. And as he reads that to us, as we uh, gather that together, we touch the chords of some people even here this morning. Some who've been not just sad, not just concerned, not just anxious, not under stress, but that unusual, unusual sorrowful stress. A stress that can lead even to death, the kind that just so overwhelms you that that you, you want to cry out to God, but you also want to cry out to your friends. I just got to let you know what's going on. I, I just need you to pray with me. I, just, I, I would just love it if you would just be here with me. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's not telling them something to pray. He's not, he's not giving them. He just wants them there as he goes through this moment. Now, Jesus knows what's going to happen. He knows that he's going to be arrested, that he'll be tried. He's already told the disciples this uh, in exact order of how things are going to happen. And we also know something about Jesus, that he is not afraid of what man can do to him. In fact, he taught that to the disciples. Don't be afraid of what man can do to you. Uh, so Jesus is not here in sorrow and in great anguish over the coming death. Because he doesn't fear death. He doesn't fear... Uh, even even the, the, the kind of crucifixion that he's going to suffer. So why is it that he's so afraid of? What is it that I should say he's so sorrowful and such deep anguish over? Well, it's not death itself, nor is it the, the crucifixion or the, 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 the beating with the cat of nine tails or the mockery of a trial. None of that, even all of that put together is not what Jesus is sorrowful over here. Jesus, you remember, he told the disciples, don't fear what man can do to you. But, you know, he goes on to say what you do need to fear is what God can do. And what Jesus is sorrowful over tonight is not the nails, is not the suffocation on the cross, but the fact that he is about to endure the very wrath of God himself. It is the wrath of God that you and I are destined to suffer if we don't accept His sacrifice. That is what Jesus knows is in front of Him. He is, listen now, going to become sin. You know, yesterday when you lied, Jesus becomes that. You, you know, when at work, and you saw that other person, and, and you know, you're married, but you, you just started having those lustful thoughts. You just start, your mind just starts wondering just how far can this go. That sin, Jesus became that. That time that you cheated, that time that you, uh, the, that you just boasted about yourself to the, to, to the demise of someone else, Jesus became that specific thing that you did. He knows that he is about to become sin. He who knew no sin and is about to suffer the wrath and the separation of God. Matthew's going to tell us that on the cross, Jesus will cry out, but his cry is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That his dread, his sorrow is knowing that there's coming a moment when the Father, and he and the Father are one, and there's an intimacy there that cannot be separated, and his prayer, uh, will, will, uh, his high priestly prayer is also going to include, I look forward to the day when I'm back with you. And we enjoy that fellowship we had before the world began, a fellowship that, that continual 
fellowship together. But he also knows that there's coming a time when that's going to be broken. And the wrath of God has to be, or else God's liar, has to be poured out on Christ himself. Not any of his sins, but yours and yours and yours and yours and mine. And all the sins of all the people, God will pour that out upon Jesus. And that is the sorrow and dread that brings him to this prayer that we find. Verse 39, Jesus goes a little farther away from those three. And he fell on his face. Literally, I believe, just full frontal, right on his, uh, his body, just falls right to the ground on his face. As humble, as low as he could get. And he cried out and he prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup, Pass from me. He says, my Father. You know, on the cross, he says, my God. My God, why have you forsaken me? You know, 170 times in the Gospels, Jesus uh, talks to his Father. He calls him my Father, uh, Abba, every single time except once. And that's when he's on the cross. Here he is in this intimate prayer with his Father, but there's, he knows there's coming the time when he won't be able to address him as his father. But he'll have to address him in that judicial sense. Uh, Eloi, my God. He's going to have to see him as the judge that he is. But here, he's praying and he, and he prays in that intimacy and says, my father, if possible, let this cup pass. Now why this prayer for us? I believe it's to instruct us, Okay. I believe it's to show us what we need to do. You know, we're to imitate Christ. And this prayer is recorded for us so that we know how to imitate Him during those times of tremendous sorrow in our life. When you don't know what to pray. When you don't know what you're going to do or how tomorrow is going to look or how you're even going to live when you get to that point when you think you're going to die. If something doesn't improve, you think you can't even gather the breath to go on for the next day. And you just fall out before God, first of all. And notice your first request. Jesus' first request. It's your first request. Why deny it? Your request is, let this cup pass, Father. Can this cup pass from me? Now, that's his prayer here. He says, if it's possible, let this cup pass. Pass from me. If it's possible, I don't want to go through what is surely about to come. And that's our prayer. That's a, the, the natural prayer that we have. Oh God, if it's possible, stop this from happening in my life. Oh God, if it's possible, keep me from having to go through this. That's an honest prayer. And you're dishonest with God and with yourself if you fall before Him and just uh, spew out some sort of rhetorical nonsense to Him. Well, when there in your heart wanting to come out is your complaint or your concern or your fear. Well, let it come out to God. That's what Jesus did. Uh, he said, Father, Abba, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Don't miss that. Don't uh, religify that. Don't reduce that down to, well, he's God, and so he's just saying that. No, this is the cry of the heart of a person fully human and fully aware of the anguish and the sorrow that's facing him. Don't cheapen your own sorrow. Don't cheapen your own trouble by failing to see that you have a Savior who's been tempted and who has gone through everything that you've gone through except without sin. Are you in anguish today? Are you distraught today? Has your life fallen apart today? Jesus has been there. Jesus is showing us that. No, no matter the level, the depth, the hurt that you may be going through this morning, you and I know that it's going to pale in comparison to what Christ is feeling at this moment. So if Christ is doing this, surely you can do it too. And that's to cry out to God. Just fully own your face before Him. 
say, God, if it's possible, I don't want this to happen to my child. Father, if it's possible, I don't want this to happen to my parent, to my marriage, to my future, to my present, to my best friend, to me. God, if it's possible. Oh God, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you the reason I'm here in such anguish. It's because I want this to stop. That's where Jesus begins His prayer. Then His next phrase that He gives us is so important that we understand because we say this lots of times and I think we say it without understanding even what we're saying. But when Jesus says that, we need to really understand what He's saying here. He says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Father, if it's possible, if there's any way at all that I can do your will without having to suffer separation from you, without having to suffer your judicial wrath, oh God, let's do that. But I know that I don't want to do anything that's not your will for me. Father, if it's at all possible, save my marriage, save my health, rescue my child. But Father, no matter what, I want to ask that Your will be done for me, for my child. Father, I know that Your will is perfect. And I know that Your desire is that I do Your will. So Father, I'm asking You, that if it's possible, if this is, can be part of your will, then let it be. But nevertheless, God, I do want your will to be done. We've all got to come to that part, point in our prayer. You see, God can never grant us something that's outside of His best interest for us, outside of His desire for us. And we have to come to terms with that in our anguish. We have to realize that God's wishes are not always our wishes, that God's will is seldom our will, but that even in our will, we desire to make it God's will. We as believers, we want to do the will of God. And so we have to pray that. We have to pray it with sincerity, not as a coverall, not as giving God a, an excuse or some fine print in case He doesn't answer my prayer. No, God will not honor that statement if you just say it in some sort of a ritualistic way. But when you pray, God, my greatest desire is Your will be done, then that's a God-honoring prayer. Jesus prays this prayer. It's first of three. And then He comes back to the disciples in verse 40 and He finds them sleeping. He says to Peter, really he says to all of them, because this is in the plural, so could you, could you all not watch with me one hour? I don't think Jesus is accusing them at this point. I don't think he's so much condemning them at this point as we often like to think of this. I think he's recognizing their limitations. He is fully human as they are. As you are, so was Christ, okay? Okay? And he's fully aware of what they've been through and fully aware that they don't understand just what all he's going through. And listen, your friends will come up short when you ask them to be with you, when you ask them to help you. Sometimes their help is, it doesn't have anything to do with what you really need. But really, that's not the point at all. The point is they come, okay? And so too with Jesus. Notice what he says. Verse 41 Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, Jesus is saying, I know that your spirit wants to watch and pray for me. I know I've seen you. Uh, I, I know what your spirit desires to do. And I also know about your flesh. I know that your flesh is weak. I know that it's tired. I know that it's not strong enough to get through that. So what I want you to do is watch and pray. I want you to watch and pray. I want you to uh, come to that point where you can overcome your flesh's desire to just rest. And instead that you stay up, that you continue to watch, and that you continue to pray. It doesn't tell them what to pray for. Part of it, no doubt, was just to pray that they could stay away. Part of it was to just pray for whatever it was Jesus is going through right now. The 
Spirit is often willing in our lives. And often our flesh is so controlling of our lives that we have trouble uh, controlling it in order to, to achieve what God wants us to do. And so too with these disciples. So Jesus, in verse 42, goes a second time, and He prays, My Father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, Your will be done. First time He says, if it's possible, let it pass. Now He says, if it can't pass, if my marriage has to end, if the disease is not going to go away, if this cup is not going to pass for me, if I'm going to have to go through this, then God, my prayer is that through it all, your will is done. That Satan doesn't mess with it that He doesn't distract from it, but that I drink it all. I drink every bit that You have prepared for me to drink, that Your will be completely done. Now He goes back to the disciples again in verse 43, and He found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, He went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. He goes for the third time and Jesus falls on His face before His Father and He says again, My Father, if it's possible, I don't want to drink this cup. But more than that, I want Your will to be done. Three times. The same prayer each time. You've been there. You've prayed all that first night when the trauma hit. You prayed again the next day. You prayed again that night, when you found out a little bit more information, when it became a little bit more certain, when it became a little bit more inevitable. The prayer is the same every time. But notice what is the key through all of this. What's the common thread? And that is that the will of God is going to be done. Jesus in His humanity, and I don't want you to miss this, is building up in His own heart for us to understand so that we can model this, that He is focusing less and less on the cup and more and more on the will of God. And that's the progress of our prayer. That's what will get us to where Jesus is about to be. Because you see, Jesus goes into the garden sorrowful and in deep anguish. He goes into the garden with his heart heavy, even to the point of death. And he prays to to God what help he can get from his friends, but really in his own heart. He's praying to God. He's wrestling with his desire to not have to drink the cup and his commitment to drink every bit of it that God has poured for him to drink. And when he comes out of that prayer, and when you come to that point that you realize that your God will never leave you nor forsake you, that whatever his will is for you, in the trauma and in the terrible moment that you're in. And it is terrible. And no, you don't want to be in it. And no, you don't want to go through it. Hence, you pray to avoid it. Jesus did too. He focused on the will of God. He said, your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. Then more than anything, I want your will to be done. More than this cup passing, if it's your will for me to drink it, I don't want to miss a drop of what you have for me to drink. Then, in verse 45, after praying that the third time, he came to his disciples and he said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus goes into Gethsemane and He falls on His face in anguish and deep sorrow. And at the end of that prayer, when He uh, uh, confirms His commitment to do the will of God, what happens? He says, rise and let us go. You see, we come to these points in our life when we are just falling 
right before God and we're praying and we're just begging God, if it's at all possible, God, change the root of my life here. Change the course of these events. Oh God, I want your will to be done. But God, if it's possible, I want your will to be that this doesn't happen this way. And we continue to pray, and then as we pray, we begin to focus on the fact that God's will is not a bad thing, that it's a good thing, that we desire it. We desire it more than honey. We desire it more than water. That we desire it more than life itself, that we understand that God's will is what gets us through this life. And when we have come to that reconciliation with God that His will is best for us, then we rise up from our face. We say, rise up and let's go meet this enemy. Jesus comes to the garden in anguish and prayer and He leaves the garden looking for the enemy. My friends, God has that power available to you. You may be hurting you may be in deep sorrow. My friends, stay in prayer to God. Stay in prayer as you reconcile, as He reconciles with you His will in your circumstance. And you stay there once, twice, three times, however long it takes, until you will come to the same conclusion that Jesus came to. And He said, enough of this. Let's rise. Our enemy is at hand. And you'll be able to face that cancer. You'll face that divorce. You'll be able to face that challenge uh, with your child, whatever it might be, whatever has tempted to destroy you. You'll be able to face it now with the strength of God. Saying, rise up, let's go. Our enemy is here. And we need to meet it. It didn't go away. It didn't dissolve this time. It didn't disappear this time. In fact, he's at the entrance to the garden now. But I'm strengthened now. Let me tell you something. This was Satan's night. There in the garden was Satan's final temptation. This is when he wanted to tempt Christ. This was when he wanted to get him to turn from the cross. And this is the night when your victory was won. Not on the cross. Really it was in Gethsemane that the battle was won. It's in Gethsemane when Jesus says, Rise, let us go meet our enemy. That Satan loses his battle. Listen, you may see a tremendous test in your life. It may be facing you this week, but I want to tell you your victory comes when you rise up from your prayer and say, let's meet the enemy. When you rise up from your prayer and you say, let's face what tomorrow's going to bring. Let's face this circumstance. The victory is not so much in you enduring through the circumstance. The victory really comes when in your heart you make the commitment to God to persevere through it. When you make the commitment to depend on God in that moment. Jesus really won the victory for all of us, there in the garden. When in the moment of deepest human anguish, when so many people would fall away, he says, rise, let us be going, my betrayer is at hand. And he's not running from the betrayer. He's walking right to him. Strength and courage that God can give will be that same moment when you can face the inevitable trouble that inevitable cup with grace and dignity and strength. You'll drink it. The world will see a victory in your enduring through it. But you'll know the victory came the night before when you gave the problem to God. When you gave your heart and your soul and your anxieties and your concerns and your burdens to Him. And said, God, I have reconciled that your will is what I need in my life. And if this is your will, I'll go through every bit of it you have prepared for me. That's where your victory will be, my friend. That will be there on your knees. That's where you'll go from the utter feeling of defeat and 
loneliness and annihilation to feeling victorious and united and strong. And you'll go into whatever faces you tomorrow with the courage of Christ to stand beside you. Jesus goes to the trial, to the arrest, to the beatings, to the crucifixion with the resolution of doing God's will that He secured in the garden and for us to understand. Our Father in heaven, Lord, in every life that's gathered here this morning, there are times of deep and troubling trials. Our jobs dissolve right in front of us. Our future becomes uncertain. Our family unit seems to break apart. Our desires and plans and things that seem so set in stone crumble like rubble before us. Our hearts melt. We can't sleep. We don't see any hope. So we come to You, Father. And we know that You're in charge of our life, but still, Father, we just want to ask You that this current thing can pass. But Father, we gather here this morning with a solid resolution that Your will for our life is what we desire the most. And though our flesh steps in and though at times it tends to draw us back and away from You, Father. Our spirit is willing to follow You through whatever course and path You would have us to go through. And so, O oh God, we come here this morning and we pray to a holy and loving and righteous Father. And we say, Abba, will You help us? Will You show us Your will? Will You let us drink the cup that You have prepared for us? And Father, we leave here today victorious already, knowing that Your will gains us that victory. Father, help us this morning in this song as we sing to just empty ourselves of, of all pretense, to, to be able to come before You, Father, to bring our burden and to just drop it here at this altar. To just say, O oh God, if possible, but if not, let Your will be done in my situation. Father, speak to our hearts today to give us that courage we need to even come and to pray before You give our burdens over to You, to let go of our concerns and let You have them. Lord, speak to hearts of those that don't know You as Abba. That maybe this morning they see in the prayer a desire to have a Savior like that who understands the disappointments and difficulties and that they would come and receive You and Your sacrifice is their very own. Let Your Spirit have free reign in these next moments, O oh God. Remove the distractions of our heart so that we can hear from heaven. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.